Jets are such a part of modern life that when we see a plane that's not a jet, well, that's more of a spectacle. But of course, jet engines were not always the standard. It was during this war that they first really appeared and first showed their tremendous promise. So let's take a look at the early jet development. I'm Indy Nidell. This is a World War II in real time special about jet development during World War II. Well, mainly British and German today. Anyhow, jet engines. What would modern travel look like without them? But how did people see them back then? A strange sight. These aircraft without a propeller, hidden in two streamlined cylinders below the airfoil were the jet turbines. None of the engineers could tell us exactly what horsepower they developed. This made us piston engine pilots very skeptical at first, for we were not yet tuned in to the peculiarities of this unknown thrust. But the engineers and their bizarre calculations were right. Essentially, there really was no comparison with the power output for propellers. If the data they fed us, based on their calculations and to some extent already proven in flight, was even only more or less correct, then it opened up undreamed of possibilities. And everything depended on it. The general idea is actually much older than you might think. According to Newton's laws of motion, it all comes down to mass being propelled forward via the backward ejection of a high-speed jet of gas or liquid. Throughout history, this principle of rocketry had inventors interested in the possibilities of jet-powered flight, but only in the 1930s did the dream begin to become reality. From inside his simple workshop, British engineer Frank Whittle had nearly given up on convincing the industry to support his turbojet engine. It seemed simply before its time, and traditional piston engine planes remained the kings of the skies. Yet Whittle was certain that his turbines were not just an extremely powerful windmill, but the future of air travel itself. On paper, the engine of a turbojet was divided into a few basic parts. The compressor, a combustion chamber assembly, the turbine itself, and an exhaust pipe which ends in a jet nozzle. Once large quantities of air have been drawn in through the front of the engine, they pass through these parts in a continuous flow. Inside the combustion chambers, the air is compressed and heated by the steady combustion of fuel. Then the hot gases pass through the turbine to provide power to its revolving blades. And at the end, they pass along the exhaust duct and emerge from the nozzle, propelling the jet stream at high velocity. Whittle's first turbine prototype in 1935 achieved more than 17,700 revolutions per minute, creating a top speed of nearly 1,500 feet per second. That's 1,023 miles per hour, or 1,646 kilometers per hour. Both the engine power to drive the compressor and the combustion intensity were at levels never seen before. If such an engine could be mounted on a plane, it would surpass anything the piston engines could deliver. However, the Aeronautical Research Committee and the Director of Scientific Research of the Air Ministry remained skeptical. One reason was the hazardous nature of the first turbine engine tests. Engines could easily accelerate out of control, and as revolutions and heat rose, there was always the danger that fuel vapors would ignite and the whole thing might just go up in flames. Whittle writes of such a close call. I signaled for an increase of speed of the starter motor, and as the tachometer indicated 2,000 RPM, I gradually opened the main control valve. For a second or two, the speed of the engine increased slowly, and then, with a rising shriek like an air raid siren, the speed began to rise rapidly, and large patches of red heat became visible on the combustion chamber casing. The engine was obviously out of control. The personnel, realizing what this meant, took to their heels in varying directions, one or two of them into large steam turbine exhaust casings which were standing nearby and which made useful shelters for such emergencies. Overheating and uncontrolled acceleration could quite literally tear the engine apart in a ball of flame and shrieking noise. The key to success was finding just the right amount of pressure and temperature distribution to keep the combustion chamber and the turbine blades under control. Whittle had designed his engine 
after the vortex of a whirlpool, where the velocity increases as the pressure decreases towards the center. This meant that the angle of the turbine blades had to increase accordingly to ensure what was called full peripheral admission of the jet flows. Funding and support of Whittle's turbojet engine continued to be slow until the breakout of the Second World War began to shake things up. The start of the war in Europe actually coincided with the maiden flight of one of the first jet planes in the world, the German-made HE-178. Suddenly, the British Air Ministry, despite the demands of the war, wanted to get prototypes into the air. The Gloucester Aircraft Company was indeed quite quick about building the Gloucester Whittle E-2829 prototype, which achieved a top speed of 370 miles per hour, 595 kilometers. Yet, despite already outclassing contemporary piston engine fighters, the British industry was still hesitant about believing the future was the turbojet. As for the German jets, at the same time Frank Whittle was doing his experiments, a German engineer had plunged deep into the same vortex. Hans von Ohain presented his concept of a continuous cycle combustion engine to the Heinkel aircraft manufacturer. In August 1939, the first prototype took to the skies. Yet the HE-178, and a year later the HE-280, failed to impress the German hierarchy enough to get approval for production. While both Wittel and von Ohain brought forward revolutionary designs, there was still nothing more than just prototypes. There was, however, another man, famed German aircraft designer Willy Messerschmitt, who thought that jet planes had the power to single-handedly turn the war in the air around. And by 1941, Messerschmitt found himself neck deep in trouble with Nazi command. He had just lost millions of Reichsmarks from the failure of the ME-210 and was in dire need of the weapon he was secretly working on, the jet fighter ME-262. Its engine was pretty similar to the designs that were used in modern commercial flight, with a single-stage axial turbine driving an eight-stage axial flow compressor, which in turn was attached to six single combustion chambers. At first, they had planned only for a maximum thrust of 600 kilos, but already by the end of 1941, they had achieved 1,000 kilos with an engine running time of 10 hours straight. Messerschmitt's engineers might have taken it even higher had they not run into the same problems as their competitors. The high velocity of the blades and the corresponding rise in temperatures threatened to tear the engine apart. The resonance of different vibrations between the blades and the combustion chambers could wrench the red-hot turbines out of their sockets. Technically, these problems could be solved with, with extra attention to special regulators, heat-resistant materials, extra air-cooling measures, but such things were in short supply. Heat-resistant sources like nickel, cobalt, and molybdenum were not wasted on experimental designs, so Messerschmitt had to simply add normal steel plates to the most vulnerable areas. Such a compromise limited the thrust to 900 kilos, but still enabled the turbines to reach 8,700 revs per minute. Thing is, even when the materials held, just actually flying the first jet planes was an extremely dangerous job, and only given to the most experienced pilots, like Adolf Galland, who wanted to see Messerschmitt's invention for himself in 1943. By then, the Luftwaffe's ability to defend the Reich's airspace was no longer what it had been, and fleets of Allied bombers pummeled at cities and factories. Allied fighter aircraft were beginning to outclass the Germans too, and especially the enemy radio and radar technology was superior. If this all continued, then total Allied air supremacy could be around the corner. Galland was one of the few big shots who actively sought a real solution, and he found it in the ME-262. Strictly following the instructions of the test pilots, Galland turned the turbo engines on. It was necessary to allow the revolutions to mount until they reached about 8,000 per minute before even thinking of stepping off the brake. Then the pilot had to very gently push the throttle levers forward. If he was too forceful, then the turbines would cut out and more often than not catch fire. Released to the runway, 
the jet aircraft naturally accelerated much faster than a piston engine plane. The pilot had to get the pressure on the foot brake just right in order to raise the tail control surface out of the slipstream. If he braked too hard at such a high speed, the plane would somersault. If he did it too softly, then the tail would not rise high enough to escape the slipstream and he would overshoot the runway. But ah, once in the air, Galland felt like he was pushed along by angels. There was no noisy piston engine working in the fuselage, only the softly rustling turbines to the side. Handling was also a lot smoother, even as the plane reached unparalleled levels of acceleration. For the first time, I was flying under jet power. No engine vibrations, no turning moment, and no whipping noise from an air screw. With a whistling sound, my turbo shot through the air. Flight characteristics, turning ability, top speed, rate of climb, in just a few minutes, I had to form an opinion of this new aircraft. The, at the time, fantastic speed of 850 kilometers per hour in level flight meant a jump of at least 200 kilometers ahead of the fastest piston engine fighter anywhere. Moreover, the aircraft could stay up from 50 to 70 minutes. For fuel, it used a less costly diesel type oil instead of the highly refined anti-knock kerosene which was being ever harder for us to obtain. But already I knew that what these aircraft promised surpassed all previous notions and ideas to such an extent that whatever uncertainties might still remain could be utterly disregarded. The engines are completely convincing, except at takeoff and landing. The aircraft opens up fully new tactical possibilities. Gallon's glowing opinion of the ME-262 finally attracted the attention of Adolf Hitler himself. In August 1943, Hitler attended an exhibition flight and was immediately enthralled by the possibilities. His mind, however, wandered towards a fateful direction for the near future of the jet fighter. Hitler asked Messerschmitt if his new invention was able to carry bombs. Hesitantly, the designer answered, well, jawohl, mein Führer. In theory, most certainly, yes. Hitler beamed at the answer, exclaiming, This is finally the Blitz Bomber. This is finally the aircraft I have been asking the Luftwaffe to provide for years. But the ME-262 was anything but the bomber Hitler wanted. There was no bomb site, no release system, nothing in the current design that could even make such a conversion feasible. However, defying Hitler's wishes was simply not an option, and precious months were squandered trying to convert and modify the jet fighter into something that took away all its advantages. During that time, Messerschmitt saw the window closing where the superior ME-262 could have maybe turned the war in the skies above Germany around. Commando Novotny and Dahl Sturmgruppe, sure, they enjoyed some success harassing Allied bomb formations, but it was too little too late. In the end, all it did was write a new chapter in the what could have been great book of wasted ideas. There were many other different jet fighters and even some jet bomber designs that came to life during the Second World War from several other nations too, other than Britain and Germany. Most of them would, however, not leave the prototype stage and those that did would come too late to have an impact on the war itself. The Gloucester Meteor, the Arado AR-234, the P-80 Shooting Star, even the Nakajima Kika, for example. But anyone who had the chance to see or to actually experience the power of the jet was immediately taken in by the unmatched potential such aircrafts had for the future. Hey, if you'd like to see a special about the state of the Luftwaffe in 1943, you can click right here for that. These specials are made possible by the Time Ghost Army. So join the army at timeghost.tv or patreon.com. Do not forget to subscribe and I'll see you next time.